Roger and I had worked on the stage show and, and in a way had almost devised the film by the time we came to Alan. And Alan um, naturally wanted to do it his way, which is his job. You know, he want, he, if he was going to be directing the film, then he wanted to, to take over. And um, I felt at that point when he was taking over as, as though I was being slightly sidelined and didn't particularly like that. It was really uh, those instances between where the live action finished and the animation took over were, um, shall I say, not, not in terms of difficulty uh, between the two, uh, uh, between Alan and Gerald, but just where they would come and where they would, uh, where they would start and where they would finish in the movie and how much of, uh, of each sequence was necessary to create the feel that was needed for that particular sequence of events and that song. All the animation was done by Gerald Scarf uh, uh, and, uh, uh, and Roger himself looking after all that. My job really was the cohesion of how the live action worked its way into, uh, into the uh, animation and how you came out of the animation into the live action so that that fusion actually was seamless. Now, the flower sequence, for instance, I think that just sort of sprang from my, uh, my imagination one day. I remember making a series of very, very quick drawings about the flowers growing up and caressing one another and then sort of almost turning into vaguely human forms to make love, to copulate suddenly, and then that's very violently over and they're suddenly twisting around one another in a kind of anxiety and then they attack one another and, and then fly off like sort of... Oh, the female devours the male. <laughs> there we go. And flies off in, into the distance. I attempted to do it in this very, very uh, delicate style, which meant that each drawing, and there are 12 drawings per second in animation, had to be rendered very, very carefully in colored crayon, in colored pencil. And I think each drawing took maybe two days to do. And there were thousands of them. For the flower sequences, for instance, um, you know, you, you would have to, and I'm sure you have asked Jerry Scarf about that. I mean, when we were watching the movie together and doing a commentary for this DVD, um, you know, and, and those sequences come up, I'm always joking with him and saying, what's that, Jerry? <laughs> you know, what's that flower turning into? And he goes, well, I haven't offended that. But, uh, you know, so that's Jerry. Now, in all that kind of very kind of sexual um, images that he draws, there are resonances, I suppose, for everybody, and certainly there are for me. Um, so you could say that um, those are projections of the bit of pink that is within Jerry's scarf. Well, where, where the animation comes from is a tough question, really, because I'm not sure I've ever thought of that. Where does it come from? Does it come from Pink himself? Is it his point of view? Is it my point of view? Is it Roger's point of view? Is it the film's point of view? I think it's a bit of everything. But I suppose if I had to come down on one, one side, it would be that it is all happening in Pink's imagination. He's having a breakdown, as we know. And these images are... Certainly the trial is sort of flashing through his mind. Um, Goodbye Blue Skies, which I think in a way is my favorite sequence, which is about the last war, um, is a kind of reminiscent piece. And Pink at that time is a baby in the pram, so I'm not sure that he could be realizing anything about the last war. Uh, so I'm, they, they are my statements in the film, uh, which complement, hopefully, the narrative and all that's happening elsewhere. I especially liked the, the hotel room that Pink was ensconced, if you like. It, um, it was a kind of nucleus throughout the film. Um, initially, I lit that room with Pink fixated in front of his TV. I lit it really just by the TV and then boosted the lighting strongly. Um, because it took me towards that Gerald Scarf look. It also had the feeling of trapping Pink in the light of the TV and isolating him from the whole world, you know, and it had a lot to do with his own paranoia and his own self-conscious drug state. 
you know, if you like, like a butterfly trapped in this, in this light. Uh, the transitions of animation in the film had to be worked on uh, in close association with Alan uh, because he had to shoot the scene from which I would spring. Um, of course, we discussed what we were going to do, and there is one that comes to mind where the shadow of a figure appears on a wall behind. So Alan very carefully shot it so that this woman's silhouette was sharply defined on the wall behind her. I then took that frame of film and animated from that um, and brought this huge kind of monstrous praying mantis figure out of the shadow. Uh, the lighting in the hotel room when Pink was really going through his paranoid situation is a moment where his wife's shadow arrives on the wall. And I was really excited by that scene, knowing that Gerald was going to meld his animation into the live action. Um, so we lit this enlarged, out-of-scale uh, hotel room just with one large arc on the floor with a clear glass. And it gave us a wonderful sharp shadow of her figure, which walked apparently on the floor. And um, partway through that scene, Gerald takes the shadow into the animation. A uh, lovely combination of traditional kind of work and this creative element that Gerald has. The trial was the first sequence that I did, and when Roger came to me with that, he had more or less uh, a strict set of lyrics that one had to illustrate. So I knew what the characters, who the characters would be. I didn't know how they would look. Um, and um, there was this thought that the judge should be a worm, and at one point, in fact, he does turn into a worm. And then I, at the back of my mind, had this idea I think it's Charles Dickens said the law is an ass or something, and I, so I made the law an ass, and it had this gi gigantic backside, which w wore a wig, and spoke out of its orifice, and denounced everything, um, which seemed to me to kind of fit, fit the image I wanted. So, but uh, I, I chose lots of different images there, and Roger's always been extremely kind of open to. I think his philo philosophy is. If you invite an artist to do something, you can't quarrel with what they're doing. Well, that's what you, in, you will employ them for. When we got into the uh, mixing theatre, it was amazing because for the first time, certainly on Pinewoods, and I had to actually uh, uh, get permission for James uh, Guthrie to, to mix the movie because uh, we were working in under a union uh, agreement within, the, uh, within Pinewood Studios. So the two mixers mixed the effects and the film uh, side of the, of the mix and, uh, and James uh, mixed, I think we had two 24 track machines, mixed the, uh, mixed the actual music side of the movie. We moved into Theatre 2 at Pinewood Studios to specifically to remix the entire album to picture. Everything changes really when you're sitting down and watching visuals with, with the film. Um, so we, and also as the film was taking shape, songs needed to be shortened or lengthened. Bring the Boys Back Home, for instance, is twice the length that it is on the album. Um, Run Like Hell gets shortened quite considerably. Um, and, and also in order to make use of the film sound setup, being the film was originally released in Dolby 70 millimeter. So you have stereo surrounds, subwoofers. Um, it's, it's more of a sort of grand experience. We had set up a huge um, uh, meter on, uh, that would hung from the top of the studio, uh, from the ceiling so that we could actually watch when we were going into the red you know, and blowing the uh, blowing the uh, the sound system, and uh, we were touching on red for most of the movie. It was a rather uh, uh, rather good mix for 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 its time. Mother, we re we re-recorded Mother, um, in order to give it a more narrative style, and and so that it was better film music. So the song had to be much longer and it also had to be able to start and stop and be more dynamic and because there's a section I think we go through the song and, and uh, dynamically it changes and then there's a section where we find um, the wife comes home and finds Pink sitting behind the piano composing a song. 
all already at this point very withdrawn, and so the the song, the music of Mother, had to fade out at that point, so she could deliver her dialogue, and and then it comes back in with Roger just playing acoustic guitar and singing, and the song rebuilds. I mean, one thing that comes up a lot uh, in the movie is um, on the record you get a bit of the Battle of Britain, you know, Simon, where are you? Yeah, on all that stuff. And you hear it clearly. On, so we used that in the movie as well. Um, I don't think there's any of the Dam Busters in, on the record. You want me, Crosby? So that must have come out of discussions with Alan and my, and my kind of uh, obsession with that movie and that, that bit of, of kind of English cinema. The second half of the song, The Empty Spaces, originally was called What Shall We Do Now? And it was all one piece of, one piece of music. It was on the original album. And we removed it from the original album, I, I think at the time, to just make the storytelling of the album a bit more concise. And so this was a great opportunity to reintroduce that, because it's a terrific piece of music. And it's, it's the whole list that happens after, of what should we do now, after the empty spaces. When the Tigers Broke Free um, is important piece of the narrative. And I think it was a song that I had, I think it's a song that I had written earlier, which didn't find its way onto the um, album or into the original show on the grounds that it was too Roger Waters specific, because it is the story of my father's death. When the Tigers broke free, originally we recorded that as one piece of music, as one song. It appears in the film in two pieces, so we basically mixed the first half, faded out, and then we go into a, another series of sections, and then it does a reprise after, um, after Break One, I think it is. In the movie, it became clear that part of the way to make the movie work was to be much more specific in terms of the uh, autobiographical narrative. Consequently, that song could fit back in it again, so we recorded it. With the Ponte de Lis male voice choir from Gorsainen in near Cardiff, who, uh, and that was wonderful working with them. Hey You was in the film originally right up until right towards the end and we actually dubbed that reel it was the original reel seven and uh, one day Roger and Alan Parker sat down to watch the film together and my understanding is they got to the end of the picture and Alan said to Roger what do you think and Roger said I think it's pretty good but we should cut out reel seven I remember sitting and watching it all with Alan and thinking God oh, this is too long and it's good. it rambles here and it, this and that and so, so I think it was my idea to dump pay you I just said, it's just too much, you know. You, it just, I think we'll just lose everybody at this point, so why don't we just dump it? As soon as they decided to remove that reel from the film, Jerry Hambling recut, I would say, about 90% of that footage, or 80 or 90% of that footage, into, he did a number of fast cut sort of collage montage scenes in Brick 3, for instance, and it happens again um, on the tear down the wall section at the end. So most of what was there visually for Real 7, you still see in the picture. All we lose, unfortunately, is the song, Hey You. It was interesting because the film was shown at the Cannes Film Festival that year that was finished. It wasn't actually running the competition, but it was shown at the festival at midnight one night, and Britannia Row, which was the Pink Floyd rental company at the time, took an entire PA system down to the theater, set it up behind the screen in place of the normal cinema sound system, and played it at gig level. And the, the look on people's faces, it was, it was classic. When I finished the film, I, I didn't really want to watch it. Of course, I went to the premiere, and um, then after that, for uh, you know, 10 or 15 years, I didn't watch it. It was only quite recently when I went to see Roger in Paris, and we looked at the film together, that I looked at it. Um, and uh, it's strange looking at something you've done in the past. It's rather like going back through old diaries and seeing all the entries you've made. And in some cases, thinking, what a bloody waste of time that was. And other, time, other times, thinking when you see an entry, well, that wasn't so bad. And it was a very much the same feeling looking at the film. A lot of it, um, you know, it's had some good, good things in it. Uh, and uh, there are things I personally would have liked to do better. Um, and um, I've grown used to when you work in a collaboration, it's a certain amount of um, give and take and you have to not have things exactly the way you would like them. Making the film eventually became a very unnerving and unpleasant experience because we all fell out in a big way, you know. 
as Jerry says, he thinks it was people, he, Jerry and Alan and, and me, um, coming together. Um, all of us used to, you know, being big fish in our small ponds and, and, and getting our own way and doing our own thing and not really having to compromise or, or really collaborate with people very much. And, uh, and there were serious clashes in terms of style and, you know, philosophy. And, and so it became very difficult. In the end, this, this film was, uh, it was a creative co collaboration, quite wonderful in a creative way, and they had a lot of very different people together. From a personal point of view, it was no fun, as everybody knows. But uh, it was, uh, at the heart of it, at the heart of it is, is Roger's primal scream. It's Roger's peace and it's Roger's madness. Uh, but you had a number of very creative people who actually contributed, therefore, to this overall film from a point of view of how it was made, in so much as it's not just the work of, uh, you know, of myself and Gerald Scarf doing the animation. It's also it's, it's brilliantly photographed, I think. And also, I think Jerry Hambling, uh, the editor, should have an enormous amount of credit because, in the end, he was the final backstop to, to Roger and me. The contribution uh, of the production side to the movie, I thought, was... Uh pretty damn good. I think uh, that we actually uh, achieved everything that Alan wanted at that time. Uh, we shot on Beckton Gasworks, where, which uh, Mr Kubrick uh, shot much later on and, uh, and, uh, and did Full Metal Jacket there. Uh, so, uh, you know, we, we had some interesting, unusual locations. I think we recreated uh, uh, the storyline as depicted in our 35-page script rather well. In, in those days, we, we were really trying to do something that stood apart from, from other pictures. Film sound up until that point, had it was evolving, but it was not really that fantastic. Just at that time, I think Sense Around was coming in, and people were starting to take much more notice of, of the sound quality in a film. So we were really trying to do something that dynamically and musically was much bigger than, than a, a much bigger experience than people had had before in the, in the cinema. In fact, for the first run of the film when it opened, we went round to all the major um, first run cinemas in a number of towns in London and, and Los Angeles particularly, um, and added subwoof subwoofers into the theatre sound system and did some tweaking. and in general, uh, tweak the Dolby playback system so that it would be louder and, and uh, more of a sort of sense around experience. The movie is, you know, from my perspective, deeply flawed because it doesn't have any laughs. And um, humour is a big part of my life and it's a big part of the story as well. And somehow, and I'm, I'm not blaming anybody, you know, particularly for this, but... It, or any more than I blame myself. Somehow, no, none of that got into the film, and none of it got into the screen. It's a pretty doer to us. No, of course, I'm pleased that, that that I was part of something like that. But it didn't obviously feel like that at the time, um, and I'm not sure what people get from it. A lot of fans come up to me and say, "Wow, how do you feel after the wall?" And I say, "Well." It was just like a piece of work for me. It was a job, you know, and uh, I did my very best. But didn't it change your life? I said, no, what changed my life? What well, changed mine, they say, you know. So obviously it had some kind of message to people that I wasn't aware of at the time, which, uh, which changed their lives, so they say. I wrote a poem a few years ago that was about... It was actually about reading books. It's about that moment when you're reading a book that engrosses you and you're getting near the end and you don't want the thing to finish. So you start you start putting it down and you stop reading. Well, I do anyway. And I know this is a very common experience of people with books. And uh, so I wrote this poem, the first verse of which goes, uh, there is a magic in some books that sucks a man into connections with the spirits hard to touch that join him to his kind. And that... It goes on, a man will eke the reading out, guarded like a canteen in the desert heat, but sometimes needs must drink, and then the final drop falls sweet, the last page turns, the end. And the poem goes on, but the important bit is that sucks a man into connections with the spirits hard to touch that join him to his kind. I think all 
work that endures does that. Looking back on the music 20 years on, I think everything stands up really well. The, the film is the music, really. I mean, it's a, it's a narrative, it's a, it's a visual representation of, of that story, of Roger's story, and, and uh, great music is timeless. It may be that now that what's interesting about the 90s and about you know, the new millennium is that it may be that human beings are arriving at a point in their evolution where um, we're beginning to understand the way we work to a point where we may be able to break into the cycle, you know, the cycle of disconnectedness that we pass on from one generation to another. Looking back on the film, which we did 20 years or so ago, um, I'm left with a feeling of, well, I feel very happy that we did that film. We experimented a lot. Um, there was a strong message within the whole thing too. Uh, I always think very fondly of that project. I have a feeling that we have it within our grasp to catch up with ourselves and to actually affect our evolution by using our brains and our hearts and our minds. And maybe that's what religion is. And maybe that's what art is. Maybe that's the point of it, you know. Maybe that's the point of this movie. Maybe that's the point of all art or writing or whatever. Maybe it's all part of the process of, our, of us, of the human beings trying to evolve to the point where we can kind of get a grip on this stuff and say, we no longer need to, you know, go and murder the chimpanzee next door. I think that it was miles, years ahead of itself in what it was trying to achieve. Because it, uh, you know, it was done long before, uh, you know, MTV had even opened their doors. And I think to actually, to try and make a film that, uh, you know, it's, it's 99 minutes long, I think. It's, uh, you know, it's made up of 60 hours of filming, you know, there's 6,000 something cuts in it. There were 10,000 uh, drawings made on, on Joel Scarf's animation. Putting all that together, and at the heart of it, this incredible music, uh, I think is, uh, is as modern today as it was when it was made. In that regard, my small contribution to it, I'm quite proud of. You know, the final scenes are, are completely introspective. I mean, the trial scene is, you know, it's this internal dialogue going on within the central character. And at the end of the story, which is, this is why I haven't done the um, piece for musical theatre yet, is because up until now, I haven't known how it ended. And I certainly didn't know, I had no idea how it ended 20 years ago which is, I guess, why the ending is so enigmatic. You know, OK, tear down the wall, but then what? You know, all alone or in twos, the ones who really love you walk up and down outside the wall, some hand in hand, some gather together in bands, the bleeding hearts and the artists make their stand. But when they've given you their all, some stagger and fall. After all, it's not easy banging your heart against some mad bugger's wall. Well, so it's a very kind of open-ended and... Yeah, I, I guess the end of the movie, really, and the end of the record is going... More or less what I'm saying to you here today is I'm fucking confused, you know? Um, and yet I have a sense that... Um, I can make a difference. <laughs>